Hi, hello everyone. This is again Astronomy on Tap London. We're very happy to have you again. Um, it seems there are more and more of you coming uh, every week and it's great. Already 55 people I can see. So please bring friends, family, get you some snacks. Um, yeah, we have people from all over the world really like Europe, the US. Uh, it's amazing. Tonight I have the pleasure to have with me Chiara Chokasta, also a member of the London IoT Committee and our Instagram guru. Hi, Kara. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, and another member of the London AOT uh, committee uh, is Corentin Cadieu, who you might have uh, heard about the last, uh, last, well, three weeks ago. And he's also our Twitter guru. Hi, Corentin. Hello. Um, so, uh, yes, apologies for the delay. Um, it's been three weeks since the last time. It won't happen again. It's just, uh, it's been proposal season, uh, which means uh, us astronomers are, you know, asking the biggest telescopes. Uh, to give us time. We were pleading for more time. And so this is very, very stressful, but it is also a lot of fun. And that's how we get, uh, you know, pretty pictures. And speaking of pictures, uh, if you've not seen uh, the uh, Hubble uh, 30th uh, anniversary uh, picture, it's just gorgeous. Uh, please go and have a look. I think I can show it here. Yes, that's it. Um, it's just wonderful. Um, and uh, fun fact, so these are two nebulae, and you, you'll have a lot of press releases online where you can learn more about these. But, you know, one of them is named NGC 2020, 2020, get it? Um, so, you know, uh, things and, and I, please go and have a look online. Um, so during the week, Carta has been uh, posting some questions on Twitter. For So for those of you who do not follow us on Twitter, we will uh, briefly show the questions again and you can you know post the video or come back later and have a think about it the answers could be in the talks and we will we will discuss the answers so uh, Corentin if you can share Sorry, uh, I, I couldn't unmute myself. Yeah, so um, if you're following us on Twitter on uh, Astronomy on Tap London, uh, you probably have seen all the questions that are, that are posting there. So uh, we posted four different questions, uh, which you can either answer directly on the, on the, on the channel there uh, on YouTube, or either you can also go back to, to Twitter and, and answer them directly. Uh, so the first question was, uh, what is the size of the largest single telescope ever used for an observation? So here I'm really talking about the single instruments, not uh, multiple instruments or anything. Uh, the second question was uh, on how many bodies in the solar system have aurora has been observed. Uh, and you can answer either one, two to three, four to five, or six or more. Um, <clears throat> the third question was uh, in each pair of image, images that are shown here on, on the right. Uh, one is of something in space and the other is of something on Earth. And you have to um, find out which one is from is on Earth and which one is on in space. And or you can also post your best guess at uh, what you're actually looking at. So uh, the images are there. Uh, and the fourth question, which is um, about a controversial bunch of pixels, which is uh, shown there. Um, and the question is, what is this bunch of pixels? So either it can be a bunch of pixels. Um, the second possible answer is the second most distant galaxy ever observed. Uh, third is an image of uh, Io as seen in infrareds. And the fourth uh, answer possible is Earth um, as taken by the Voyager uh, space probe. So um, you can either post the answer on the, on the YouTube chats or go back to Twitter and uh, we'll answer all of them by the end of the, of the session. Thanks. Right. Okay. Thanks, you, Quentin. Um, so yeah, please post the answers, discuss between yourselves. Uh, we'll be looking at the chat as well. Um, I also have to mention during the talks, we have a 20 second delay. So please start posting questions uh, as we go through the talks. It will be just easier for the, for the live Q and A's uh, uh, after the talk. So yeah, the format is we had two talks tonight and uh, then we will have Q and A's and we'll answer uh, your questions and also the questions on Twitter uh, that we asked you through the week. And uh, Chiara will now introduce the two speakers. Yeah, so our first speaker today will be Dr. Ayush uh, Saxena. Hi, Ayush. Um, you joined um, UCL very recently. You're a, a researcher here in London. 
Um, but you traveled quite a lot during your career. You were in Italy before and previously in, uh, in Leiden, where you also helped organizing Astronomy on Tap there. So yeah, very nice. Uh, and you have a passion for football and you joined the, the university team and, and the league. But what happened? <laughs> in oh, I mean, it was, yeah, it was great. Um, the biggest sort of disappointment or the biggest achievement was we were playing in a league, which is like a, an amateur football league for Dutch um, football clubs within the region of Leiden and its surroundings. And so every day you had to go and play matches. No, not every day, every week, uh, every Saturday. So we sometimes you would play in our home home ground in Leiden. Sometimes you'd have to go and travel to other places. So it's like a very long six month program where you had to like constantly play. And this one season in 2018, we were absolutely killing it. Um, we were winning so many games and, you know, completely flying high. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Way at the top. But then there was another team that was catching us very, like very, very quickly. And the last game of the season was against this team. And we had to decide the winner in that game. And yeah, they, we went to play in their ground and they brought like thousands of their friends and family to like support them. And we were like, wow, this is an amateur league. Like, what are so many people doing here? And they had flares and everything, you know, intimidating atmosphere. We really fought hard, but then unfortunately we lost that game and we came so close to winning the league. But that one last cruel move that this other team played on us by bringing their friends, you know, but it was still yeah. one of the proudest. Very strong competition then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Very serious indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then, uh, well, tonight you will talk about your research. So a galaxy is very far away and absurd in the, in the radio, and radio waves. And then the second speaker is uh, Professor Steve Miller. So Steve, you are Emeritus Professor of uh, Science Communication and Planetary Science at, at UCL. Yep. Uh, hi, hi everybody. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, you worked for, for UCL uh, for quite a long time. So you started in uh, 1986. Yes. Yes. Not 1896, as you yeah. said the first time. <laughs> and then you told us something very curious about your son, your son, who uh, basically started up uh, the first Crystal Palace uh, support club in, in Bogota. That, that's right. So. Uh, my younger son, <clears throat> so most of my family, we're from the South London, Croydon area. Um, my wife's from Hawaii, but uh, that doesn't quite count. <clears throat> but um, my younger son married a Colombian woman and they now live in Bogota. And when they got married, the highlight of the wedding reception was that they both came down these wonderful stairs, this wonderful staircase wearing Crystal Palace shirts. So we're all Crystal Palace supporters in my family. Cool. So do we have followers from Bogota today as well? Uh, possibly. Yeah. They okay. know about Very it. Nice. Whether or not they've been able to get in, I don't know. Cool. Okay. And, and then, yeah, today we will talk about auroras in, in uh, planets uh, on Earth and other planets in the solar system. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. So, yeah, thank you, Chiara. Um, so just before we, we start, uh, yeah, we have basically people following us from every corner of the world. Uh, it's quite crazy if you look at the chat. Uh, and yes, from Bogota. So, uh, you know, uh, here they are. Um, so let's get immediately started with uh, Ayush Saxena talking about uh, radio galaxies far, far away. All right, thank you very much, Roman and Kira, for that lovely introduction. Let me get my screen up. All right, give me a shout if you can see my screen. Yay. Lovely, okay, yeah. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, this is the first time that I'm giving this uh, online astronomy on tap version um, and it's great to see so many people joining from all over the world and yeah I, I hope you're all keeping safe and hopefully this crisis will be over soon and then life will get back to normal and hopefully we can meet again in a pub and talk about astronomy very soon although one good thing is that having this online so many people can join from so many different places around the world so it's I would say the silver lining of um, this terrible situation but here we go. So today I'll talk to you guys about um, the radio window towards galaxies far, far away. 
And as Kira mentioned already, my name is Ayush and I'm a researcher here at University College London. Um, so let's dive into it. Um, when I say radio, or when you hear radio, I think the first thing that comes to our mind is um, just radio waves um, that bring your favorite music or match day football commentary to your car stereos, um, or even data or connectivity to our mobile phones, which people often use to watch infinite cat videos, or maybe you're, what you're using radio waves right now to watch this YouTube live. Um, so that's essentially what radio waves do in our lives. Um, and they are just like parts of light, uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, just like the optical light that we see with our eyes. Um, but they're longer wavelengths, lower energies, um, but they travel and behave in the same way as any other light would. Now, if I go on to a galaxy, like when we hear the word galaxy, um, there's something very similar to this picture that comes into our minds, which is a beautiful astronomical object made up of hundreds of thousands of billions of stars, um, which we can see from telescopes and the optical, so red to blue, um, similar to what we see with our own eyes. And they're just spectacular objects made up of stars and gas, and, you know, stars are forming and there's like so much activity happening. And it's all for us to see from the Hubble Space Telescope and whatnot. So this is what traditionally a galaxy uh, might look like in our minds. But the fun thing is that galaxies also emit radio signals. Um, they emit radio waves. Now, these waves are not as strong as what we get in our car stereo, for example. So we would never be able to pick up these radio signals from these galaxies with our own mobile phone. Um, but if you do have dedicated, strong, powerful enough radio telescopes that you can point towards these galaxies, then a picture emerges in the radio wavelength instead. And what we find surprisingly is that what a galaxy looks like in the optical uh, with starlight, it looks very different at radio wavelengths. And this is a very, so this radio image, uh, which is overlaid on top, is actually off this galaxy in the background. And you can see immediately that they're very different. Um, first of all, you see a very different structure with these two lobes on either side of the galaxy um, that are shining bright and radio. And then there's the central bright component as well that often coincides with the center of this galaxy. And it, it doesn't stop there. Um, there are also differences in how large the radio uh, emission extends uh, compared to the size of the galaxy. So in reality, if a galaxy would be what it is in the background, the radio image of that galaxy would be much, much larger scales. So it immediately tells astronomers that there is something hidden going on within, within these galaxies that in the optical, it's not so obvious, but when you move to the radio, uh, it becomes more and more apparent that there is some sort of exotic physics happening that only a radio telescope can really reveal. So that basically shows the power of studying astronomy or studying objects in the sky at many different wavelengths so that we can actually capture all of the physics happening within these galaxies. So where did radio astronomy actually begin? Like modern radio astronomy as we, um, we still know and love and still use the data from. So I think the origins of the modern radio survey, which is just the activity of pointing radio telescopes all over the sky and just detecting tons and tons of objects can be traced back to the 1950s. And it's no coincidence about the timeline of these events because they sort of coincide with the end of the World War II where radio technology with radars was extensively used um, to detect enemy ships and planes. Um, but when the war ended, there was suddenly a lot of radio equipment, high quality radio equipment, ready for astronomers, engineers and scientists to, instead of employing it for war, just turn it into an astronomical object and use these capabilities to study um, the night sky in the radio. And that is when the radio astronomy um, as a field was basically born. And a number of these radio telescopes were installed all around the world. And in the picture we see is the One Mile Telescope from Cambridge, which was one of the pioneering survey telescopes looking at the sky uh, constantly and making pictures. And what was coming out of these radio surveys was quite fascinating. 
So we know how galaxies typically look like in the optical, but in the radio, they look completely different. And as you can see from a gallery of uh, selected objects from these Cambridge surveys, um, where the object is called 3C, which is the third Cambridge survey of the sky, and the number coincides with um, the number assigned to this object when they were being identified. Um, you can see that the shapes and sizes of these galaxies are completely all over the place, very variable shapes. Um, but what is sort of common between these is that a lot of them have these two lobes on either side, and there's a central bright component um, to them. Um, this is similar to what we saw earlier with that optical galaxy and the radio uh, signal coming from that galaxy. But these two lobes can vary dramatically in their shape and their size. Um, so there was a picture emerging that radio galaxies, as these things were referred to, have this sort of phenomenon happening where there are two lobes and a central point. And this is something that we can study in more detail and figure out what's exactly going on. Um, now to also study the stellar composition of these radio sources, uh, it is very important to not only look at the radio, but also try and find its components and counterparts in the optical images. Um, so to establish the basic properties of radio galaxies, scientists had to cross match optical and radio data to see what the host galaxy of this radio emission looks like. And there were some trends that emerged from this exercise at large um, volumes in the sky. So astronomers found that radio sources are more likely to be hosted by red, more elliptical type galaxies, rather than blue, more spiral type galaxies. So it, it, there are some galaxies, spiral blue galaxies that host radio sources, but a large majority of the radio um, emission is hosted by red galaxies. And the difference is, the redder galaxies have older stars within them and the bluer galaxies are forming new stars. So that was something that was pointing towards the nature of this um, radio emission. The other thing astronomers found was that in addition to having these red elliptical galaxies host radio sources, these elliptical galaxies were often surrounded by other galaxies around them, uh, which is something astronomers call a galaxy cluster. Um, now, galaxy clusters play a very important role when you have to study the evolution of the large-scale structure of the universe. So radio sources were giving astronomers some sort of clues as to where to find these galaxies, galaxy clusters, um, which was also very powerful to study the cosmos. And then finally, astronomers also discovered that when there are galaxies merging, um, there's also radio emission coming out from there. And now we know that galaxy mergers are not uncommon at all. Um, it happens all the time around us. And it's one of the ways in which larger galaxies are formed by two smaller galaxies uh, merging together. And these galaxy mergers often triggered radio emission from these cores. But there were some radio sources that looked very different. In fact, if you look at the curious case of 3C273, which is another radio source detected in the third Cambridge um, survey. This is what its optical image looks like. Um, now, I don't know about you, but to me, it does not look like a galaxy at all. It looks more like a star. And the other important uh, property of this um, stellar-like object was that on average, it was 50 to 100 times brighter than all the other red galaxies that were hosting these um, radio sources. So not knowing any better at the time, these sort of hosts of radio sources were called quasi-stellar radio source or quasar for short, because um, they look stellar, they're almost stellar, but not quite because a lot of stars don't really have radio emission, but it is a radio source. So let's just put it as a quasi-stellar radio source. And its origin remained a mystery for a couple of years until, uh, an astronomer called Martin Schmidt, who is a Dutch astronomer based in California, published this remarkable paper in 1963, where he, he titled the paper, A Star-Like Object with a Large Redshift. Um, so what is a redshift? Um, redshift is something that we astronomers use quite extensively when we study distance, uh, distances of different objects. And it works in the following way. So we know that galaxies are made up of 
key elements like hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Um, so these are all elements that are trapped within stars in the galaxies. And the, the key property of a lot of these elements is that they emit really short bursts of light at specific wavelengths. And we can measure these wavelengths in the laboratories. So if you have a hydrogen atom and you look at what wavelengths does it actually emit the most light in, um, you get something like the spectrum at the bottom side, if I can use my pointer, um, this comparison spectrum here. So in the laboratory, scientists can measure what wavelengths these hydrogen lines will actually be brightest at. Um, and then, you know, when you're looking at a spectrum of a galaxy, you can look for these specific signatures and determine that they have hydrogen. And you can do the same with other, other elements. But what Martin Schmidt reported for this particular object was that he did spot some trends of hydrogen emission lines, um, but they were not at the right wavelengths where you would expect them inside the lab. They were all shifted towards the red. And that's where the term red shift came in because he was pretty convinced that these are hydrogen emission lines, but there is a red shift in all of their wavelengths. And this redshift effectively indicates that the source lies outside our own galaxy. And that is because only sources that are really, really far away from us actually have this redshift because light takes a long time to reach us if the source is far away. And in the meantime, the universe has expanded as well because it is constantly expanding. And if, a, if light from a source is taking billions of years to come to us, that gives the universe a long time to expand. And this expansion also shifts the light coming from these objects. And we can measure the shift. Um, and from that, we can determine how far away the object is. And it's a very tight one-to-one -one correlation between redshift and distance. And measuring the redshift of 3C273, uh, Martin Schmidt found that this galaxy or this source, the star-like source must be 3 billion light years away, um, which is remarkable because if you think about it, in the optical image, it looks as bright as a star and it's a hundred times brighter than the other sort of faint galaxies that host radio sources. So for this object to be so much brighter and also to be almost 3 billion light years away from us, it must have some insanely powerful mechanism powering this emission, not only in the optical, but also in the radio. And it took a couple of years for scientists to figure out what could actually power this emission, but they came up with this um, sort of picture, uh, which they call the engines of a quasar. And it is basically powered by a supermassive black hole, which can be up to a billion times more massive um, than our own sun. So such a massive black hole that is sitting in the center of galaxies with a very strong gravitational field around it, it begins to accrete material towards it. And this material basically starts swirling inside. And as it's falling inside the black hole, it becomes so hot and so dense that it starts glowing at unprecedented um, luminosities and energies. And then these energies are launched um, by, these, uh, by this black hole into jets. And these same jets also produce radio waves. So in this picture, you can explain both the radio jets coming out from either side of the black hole, and also the incredible brightness um, produced by this accretion event that could look like a quasar if it's pointing towards you. So to demonstrate this effect more, uh, here's a little movie. So in this, the, the, set, the supermassive black hole is sitting in the middle, accreting a lot of material around it because of its gravity. And as we zoom out from where the black hole sits traditionally in the center of a galaxy, we see that it is obviously surrounded by billions of stars around it. But that beam of light that is being emitted by this black hole is so much brighter, even when you combine the light of all of these um, different stars. And every now and then you're lucky enough for the object to be positioned in a way that this beam of light is shining towards us. And that is when you get a quasar um, because you have direct access to the black hole accretion happening which is responsible for creating so much more energy that is directed towards us. And this picture also explains um, the two-sided radio jets that people have, have seen in using radio telescopes. 
So this discovery was so remarkable and so groundbreaking at the time that Martin Schmidt actually ended up on the cover of Time magazine in 1966. Not only because he discovered a source that was so far away and at that time, the most distant source that was available uh, that was discovered, which is literally exploring the edge of the universe at the time, but also because this quasar theory completely transformed how we understand black holes, how we understand galaxies and how galaxies and black holes sort of evolve um, together. So this was all almost 50 years ago and we made tremendous progress in understanding both these black holes and the galaxies that host them using radio and optical um, data. So where are we today? Um, we now know that 3C273 uh, was confirmed to lie around 2.4 billion light years away. Um, and it was postulated to harbor a supermassive black hole of almost 900 million times more massive than the sun. So pack 900 million suns into one giant ball uh, that is the black hole, which sits in the middle of this galaxy and emits these tremendous amount of energies and luminosities. And that's what is powering 3C273. And over the next decades, when radio telescopes and optical telescopes became more powerful, we realized that quasars and radio galaxies were discovered at increasingly larger distances, and they were basically everywhere. Um, this was one of a one-off source in the 3C catalog, but since then we've discovered hundreds, if not thousands, of similar quasars and radio galaxies further and further away up from Earth. And by studying this black hole phenomenon in detail, we now understand that almost all massive galaxies in the universe must have gone through a period when their central black hole was actively eating up material. And we now know for sure that we need this quasar phase in the lifetime of a galaxy to explain the properties that it ends up with. And as we think our Milky Way galaxy went through a similar period at some point in its formation formation history. Um, so this black hole quasar phase is incredibly important in theories of galaxy evolution. And to finally put it into a bit more perspective, this is a short history of the universe where we now know that the Big Bang happened almost 13.8 billion years ago on the left side here. And then we underwent a very rapid inflation period where the universe expanded in a very small period of time. And then there was a period when nothing happened, so there were no stars or galaxies formed yet. But around 400 million years later, the first stars and galaxies started to form. And then from then on, they've evolved into the galaxies like our own Milky Way, which is sitting here in the modern day. And the further away an object is from us, the further back it is in time, because light has taken so long to reach us. And 3C273 was almost 3 billion light years away. When it was discovered 50 years ago. And now we have a detection of a quasar that's 13 billion light years away. So it's formed when the universe was basically a baby um, in the very early stages of its evolution. And with current technology, we've detected a quasar so far away from us. And in fact, we, uh, my own research team, we detected a, another radio galaxy which is not a quasar that is pointing towards us, but it has the traditional radio um, jets and lobes. Um, and this was discovered to be 12.7 billion light years away. So with the current technology in 50 years, we basically pushed the limits of the observable universe with radio and optical um, detections. And this cannot be done on your own. Like this needs a concentrated effort from the entire astronomy community all around the world. And this is shown by this example of beautiful radio telescopes um, that are currently operating all around, uh, all around the world, where in India and in the USA, we have the traditional sort of dish-like radio telescopes. But recently in the Netherlands, a more contemporary version of the radio telescope has gone online where it's just a bunch of detectors spread around instead of dishes and a supercomputer puts together the signals from all these individual detectors. Um, so you're effectively limited by computing power because you can easily add the number of detectors and keep increasing how large your effective telescope can be. 
And in the next decade, the square kilometer array um, will marry these two concepts of a traditional dish-based telescope and this contemporary um, software-driven telescope and take it to the next level across Australia and South Africa. So this is gonna open up an entire new window of discovery in the radio universe. And with that, I'd like to end and say that the future looks pretty bright if you're a radio astronomer. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ayush. If you stop sharing, maybe. Yeah. Uh, cool, okay, great. Thank you, it was a very great talk. Um, we have a lot of questions. I think we'll, we'll just start with, I think you've, you know, you've covered question four and one. I think, uh, Corentin, if you want to comment on the answers. Um, yeah, sure. Do you, you want me to, to show the answers yet or? Or maybe just the questions and we can, you know, we can give, yeah. the, you can give the answers. Okay, so, um, yep, 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 yep. Um, so the, oops, sorry, I'm trying to share my screen so that you have the, the, the questions as well. Uh, people spot the answers in the talk. Sorry? Um, people yeah, so, spot the answers. So yeah, so on the chat, we have a lot of people, and I think on YouTube as well, that said that uh, um, yeah. question one is 10 meters. And yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. So the first question was, uh, what is the size of the largest single telescope ever used for an observation? And so we had uh, four possible answers being 10 meters, 500 meters, four kilometers, or 1,208 12,800. Um, so I'll just go, oops. So I'll just go to the, to the answer actually. Um, so most people actually answer 10 meter, which is the right answer for optical telescopes. But as uh, Aish um, discussed quite a lot, there are actually a whole class of other telescope called radio telescopes. Uh, and the largest one is actually the uh, fast telescope in China with 500 meter for a single telescope. Uh, and then there's also the uh, gravitational wave detectors, which are not really telescopes, but they don't really count for the answer. And the largest uh, possible telescope you could imagine would be the size of the Earth, and it's been achieved with an array of telescopes, so it's not a single instrument uh, for the Event Horizon Telescope that uh, helps uh, scientists um, make a direct observation of the uh, uh, black hole at the center of, uh, of, our, of, um, um, of a galaxy. So the, the right answer is 500 meters for, for the telescope. Um, and then the other question, well, I will we'll come back. Okay, let's do the question four then. Um, so question four, that there was this um, controversial bunch of pixels. So what, what, what is this thing? And uh, most people actually answered that is the second most distant galaxy, which is um, correct according to the author of the of the paper that's published the um, this observation so maybe ayush you can uh, you can comment on on the results um yeah um so also just to quickly comment on question 1 the advantage of why you can have so much bigger radio telescopes is that you don't need a mirror because in the optical telescopes you need to make a mirror as big as the telescope is. So a 10 meter telescope is, is effectively a 10 meter mirror. And um, the margin for error to scale that up is quite high. But in, in a radio telescope, you just need a dish um, to focus the radio waves on it without necessarily having a mirror that does it. Um, which is why like this is, for example, a fairly new telescope, but then Arecibo as well, which has been featured in so many movies um, held the record for being a huge single radio telescope. So from a construction point of view, it's actually much, much cheaper and much easier to make a larger radio telescope than to have a 500 meter long mirror. So that's why radio telescopes constantly set um, the records for being the largest ones in the world. Um, yeah, and for question four, yeah, that's actually, um, so I personally work on um, discovering distant galaxies. Romain does the same. And I think you would agree with me when you actually have to measure distances of galaxies, you have to be very, very careful. Um, and the best way to do it is to actually measure the redshift um, of galaxies, as I talked about. Um, that is a pretty secure measurement. And if you have the redshift, you effectively know how far away the galaxy is. 
Um, but it becomes increasingly harder for fainter and fainter objects. And the further away an, uh, an object is from us, the further away a galaxy is, the fainter it appears. And obviously we're limited by technology of how sensitive we can be to detect um, emission lines from these objects. So for this source, they never really had a spectrum. So they never really had a well-defined detection of an emission line from let's say hydrogen. Um, it was more based on modeling what the individual images in different filters um, look like. And you always run into trouble when you do that because there may be things that you haven't factored in or just the universe is playing a cruel joke and you know it looks like something that is very far away but it's actually um, not as far at all. Um, or maybe it's not even a galaxy, it's like some sort of weird star within our own uh, Milky Way. So it happens all the time. And I think that's what happened with this galaxy as well, because they measured a distance, but later research showed that it might actually not be what they think it is. And it just shows the beauty of the scientific method in a way where, you know, we just debate and falsify everything. And there is one correct answer after all. So yeah, the jury is still out about whether or not we trust whether it's actually a distant galaxy. But I think in the future, we'll, we'll find out. Okay, great, excellent. Uh, if you can stop sharing, maybe. Uh, Quentin, yes, okay, that's cool. Uh, we'll take now quickly, quick fire questions from the chat. Um, Chiara, you want to go first, maybe? Yeah, well, I picked a question um, asking how long it takes for the matter to be accreted by the, the supermassive black hole. Hmm, that's an excellent question. Um, so these are very long processes, and we think that it takes somewhere between a million to 10 million years when the black hole is actually active. Um, so it can accrete for, let's say, a million to a 10 million years, but then it eventually runs out of material within its own gravitational influence. And that's when the black hole stops. And that's when usually the quasar stops being so bright and slowly the radio fades away as well. Um, so the fact that we see this quasar or we see this radio emission means that the black hole is currently active or has shut off very recently. Um, and then you can ex sort of connect these theories all together. And that is how we come up with a suggestion that at some point, all of these galaxies must have been, uh, must have had active black holes, but they're not active anymore. Yeah, so in a way you've answered one of the other questions, which is uh, what is a non-radio quasar? And, you know, it's the fact that the, the naming has changed so much that, you know, at the beginning we had quasi-stellar object, then, then quasars, then QSOs, and basically they've been unified. And so now you would talk about a radio loud or a radio quiet uh, quasar, but really they're more or less the same objects, just different points in the life perhaps. Yeah, and a lot of, because earlier the radio detection of a quasar meant that every quasar was by definition a radio source, a quasi-stellar radio source. But then when technologies improved and we could discover more and more objects, we realized that not every quasar necessarily shines in the radio because to have radio jets coming out, you need very specific physical conditions and not all quasars end up achieving these conditions. And now I think the radio fraction of quasars is around 10%. So optically bright quasars are more numerous when you compare it to sort of radio um, bright quasars as well. So, but this is an area of active research. Okay, uh, let's take one final question and then we'll move on to the talks. And if there are more questions, we'll just try and answer them after the second talk maybe. And Chiara? Yeah, so there is a question asking, um, what is a, so you showed before the, um, the image of the uh, evolution of the universe from the Big Bang to the present days. And there is a question asking, what is outside the big funnel in your illustration? So maybe if you can share it again. Outside my funnel. Let's see. Yeah, well, you showed the, the universe expanding. And the question is, what is it expanding into? Oh, wow, that's a metaphysical question. But let's, let's give it a shot. Did it share? 
Yeah. It, yeah. If you mean this specific um, thing, that's just a space-based telescope. Um, but yeah, so there's, in a way, there's nothing outside the funnel. The funnel is the universe, it's space and time. So when we say that the universe is expanding, it's not really expanding into something, but space itself is being pulled apart. Um, and you can think of it as like blowing air into a balloon. Like you can mark like a little red spot on the balloon. If you keep blowing it, the balloon itself will expand and this red spot will become larger and larger. So it's not really expanding into anything. The space time itself is expanding. And this is what we understand from, we limit astronomy to the realms of universe that we understand. And now there's obviously open questions of what came before the Big Bang and, you know, like, are there other universes around? Um, but we don't know that yet. And it's still, I think, very mathematical or philosophical in nature. But when we deal with observational astronomy, um, we deal with our own universe and the expansion of the universe is just space itself being stretched, driven by dark energy. I don't know if that answers the question, but... Yeah, I think yes. it does. Um, also, you've ticked the other mark of answering another question, uh, <laughs> which has, you know, do we have black holes before the Big Bang? Uh, and I think you've pretty much answered it. We don't really know what's before the Big Bang, and therefore uh, we can't really tell. But like the, the, the physics as we know it now says no, or at least you can't know. That's, that's kind of the thing. Right. Should we move on to Steve's talk? Um, Steve, are you? Yeah. yeah? Okay. So, so I'm going to try and share my screen and you'll have to tell me whether or not that will work. So let's have a look. So it's worked for me. Has it worked for you? Yes, excellent. Please go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to talk on something a little more kind of down to earth. I'm talking about bright lights on the planets or what are called aurorae. And this absolutely stunning picture is the Earth's um, northern aurora taken from the uh, International Space Station. And if there's time at the end, I'll show a little movie showing the space station um, wafting over the uh, northern part, northern latitudes of the Earth and uh, able to see all the, these aurorae. They are beautiful. I thought that, uh, given you know, this is quite a dark time for a lot of people at the moment that seeing something light and bright would be, um, would be quite nice. Um, but they're not just beautiful and spectacular. They tell us quite a lot about the, let me see if I can get this to work, about the space environment in which we live. So I think we're learning as a human race that we're all very interconnected with each other and we're interconnected with nature. As a planet, Earth is very interconnected with the rest of the solar system. And what I'm showing you here is a not to scale, please, not to scale cartoon of the, uh, the Sun, Earth, interaction that comes under the heading of ter solar terrestrial physics. If we really were that close to, to the sun, we'd all be toast. So we're not toast. So that's great. We're not that close. But it, it's just a cartoon. And in particular, what's important about this interaction, not only do we get the sunlight that we need for life on Earth, but we're also bathed. In fact, one could say buffeted the whole time by something that is called the solar wind. The solar wind is a stream of electrically charged particles that are shot out from the sun. Um, it's very, very rarefied. So there's only six particles per cubic centimeter. That's you know better than any vacuum you can get here on Earth. So its density is very, very low, but these are electrically charged particles, so they have an impact more than just the mass of them and the number of them would, uh, uh, would lead you to believe. The other thing is they're incredibly fast. 
So they're traveling at something like 400 kilometers per second on average. Um, sometimes it could be seven, 800 kilometers a second. And what happens or what would happen, say to a planet like Mars or Venus that doesn't have much of a magnetic field, this solar wind just hits the atmosphere uh, of the planet direct. But we have quite a strong magnetic field. That's how our compasses work. So we've got a north-south magnetic field, what we would call a dipolar magnetic field. And what happens there is in the direction of the sun, our magnetic field forms an obstacle and the sun has to flow around it. And there's a shock, a bit like the way in which a ship uh, cutting through the waves creates a bow shock. Well, we create a magnetic bow shock in the solar wind. And then as the solar wind flows around our magnetic field, it drags the magnetic field backwards with us, with it, to form what is called a magneto tail. And the whole thing here is called the magnetosphere. And these charged particles, this plasma from the solar wind, can get in towards the Earth's atmosphere by funneling itself <coughs> along the magnetic field lines. And you can see the magnetic field lines are concentrated around the poles. And that is why we find that the aurora that caused when these particles hit the upper atmosphere of the Earth they are also concentrated around the poles. So as a magnetized planet, we create these beautiful northern and southern lights around the poles, and they are telling us something about the activity of the sun, the extent to which the solar wind is going faster or slower, the extent to which it's less dense or more dense, it has an impact here on Earth because it can knock out radio communications, it can affect affect satellites. It's even been um, known to burn out power grids when we've had particularly strong what are called solar storms that have uh, burnt out the power grids as happened um, a couple of decades ago in Canada. So it's an important interaction and it gives us something that we call solar terrestrial physics and it gives us the kind of um, world in which we live today, because if we didn't have that magnetic field, then a lot of the charged particles that are coming from the sun would come straight down to Earth, and we again might be toast, or at least it would be much harder for life to, life to evolve. So here is a list of the planets and their magnetic moments. So that basically says how much magnetism there is in a planet. And the Earth, forget about these units, they don't matter too much. What you can see is this power of 10, 10 to the 15. So 10 to the 15 is a million billion. That means that if you compare our magnetic moment with Mercury, then you can see that that's a million million, a million billion. We're more than a thousand times more magnetic than is Mercury and a lot more magnetic than Mars and Venus. But if we take Jupiter, this is 10 to the 20 instead of 10 to the 15. So this is a hundred billion billion, this unit here. And Jupiter has a magnetic moment that is two, 20, sorry, 20,000 times greater than Earth. So as you might expect, the effects that we see on Jupiter as a result of the interaction between the sun's solar wind and Jupiter's magnetic field are going to be that much more powerful, that much more fantastic. Now, we've been bothering Jupiter ever since pretty much the start of the space age. We sent a couple of pioneers up there in um, 1973. We sent um, a couple of voyages there in 1979. In 1995, we sent the Galileo spacecraft 
And the first thing the Galileo spacecraft did was to fire a missile into the atmosphere of Jupiter, which wasn't really very friendly and must have upset the inhabitants there having their Sunday lunch. Um, and Galileo orbited Jupiter for quite a long time. In the last decade, we've given Jupiter a bit of a rest because we've had the Cassini spacecraft out at Saturn. So we've concentrated on that rather than um, uh, Jupiter. But we've now got a spacecraft called Juno, the Jupiter Near Polar Orbiter. That's how the Americans have made up the acronym. Actually, they quite like the, uh, the name to refer to the goddess Juno. But we've got Juno. Uh, around Jupiter at this point in time. And it arrived, got into proper orbit in July of uh, 2016. It's a five-year mission, although it was originally intended to just to be a two-year mission. Um, so it goes on till 2021. <clears throat> it, the orbit is what they call very, very elliptical. So it means it goes millions and millions and millions of miles away from Jupiter at its furthest distance. But when it gets close, it gets really close. 4,000 to 8,000 kilometers skimming across <clears throat> the top of this incredibly radiate, radio um, active, uh, incredible radiation environment, incredible magnetic field. It's getting very close up and personal with, uh, with Jupiter and it's sending us back some fabulous images and just you know so you know where you are this is the the great red spot here this enormous hurricane that's been going for hundreds of years looks like it might be starting to dissipate a bit not sure and then around the polar regions here you've got all these little storms and so on and belts and zones and storms and clouds and so on what you're looking at here is an optical image of uh, Jupiter, and that's really telling you about what I would call the lower atmosphere. So that's the troposphere, the stratosphere, the part of the atmosphere that we live in here on Earth. But Juno has been able to take some amazing photographs from the top of Jupiter's atmosphere. So this is the southern aurora. It's roughly, say, a thousand kilometers higher in the atmosphere than are all of these uh, cloud features that you can see here. And this is the most detailed picture we have ever seen of Jupiter's aurora. Round here, like this, you've got something that we would call the, the main auroral oval. But Juno has been able to show us it's got little tangled ropes in it. It's got all kinds of flare uh, areas, brighter areas, less bright areas, and so on. <clears throat> Closer to the poles, you've got all kinds of very turbulent emission. You might be able to make out some little kind of like tracks here. So I'm going to say a little bit more about what they are, and little dots here. I'm going to say a little bit more about what they are and what they're telling us about the interaction between Jupiter and its space environment in just a moment. Now, most of the uh, plasma, the charged particles that come in to Earth's magnetosphere are coming from the solar wind. That's not true on Jupiter. Jupiter is orbited by, five, uh, by four large moons, so Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and closest in is Io. And it's only something <clears throat> like six times the radius of Jupiter away from the center of Jupiter, which means given that Jupiter is you know, um, many thousand times as massive as Earth, that it is, being torn, it's being stretched and squeezed by incredible gravitational forces. And that means that Io is the most volcanic body that we know of in the solar system. And this is a wonderful Voyager image where you can see all the kind of volcanic areas. This is all kind of uh, sulfurous 
uh, material around here. And then here you can actually see a volcano going off on the limb of Io, on the, on the edge of Io as we see it. And if you try and put that in to some kind of perspective, Io is putting out one ton per second into the region of space around Jupiter, the magnetosphere of Jupiter. And I worked that out that that was greater than 30 times the eruption rate of the volcano Kilauea in Hawaii. So this is very, very volcanic. And when you consider that Io is roughly 40 times less massive than the Earth, they, to be putting out that amount of material is an incredible feat, but it's because of the way that Jupiter interacts with it and pulls it backwards and forwards. <clears throat> now, this is a cartoon of um, uh, Jupiter's uh, magnetosphere. It's vast. Just so you can remember, this is the sun here. Again, clearly the distances aren't to scale. And out on the right-hand side of my screen, you're heading off towards Saturn. Earth's magnetosphere in the direction of the sun is 60,000 kilometers. Jupiter's magnetosphere in the direct direction of the sun is 7 million kilometers. And in the direction away from the sun, where the solar wind is dragging the magnetic field downstream, down tail, it stretches all the way out to the orbit of Saturn, and that's 750 million kilometers. So this is enormous. OK, here you've got little Io here, pumping one ton per second out into the magnetosphere of Jupiter. It doesn't stay there. It's being swept outwards, both by centrifugal forces and because the magnetic field of Jupiter spins along with the planet itself. So that's once every nine hours, 54 minutes, and it sweeps through this electrically charged material and it sweeps it out into an enormous magneto, uh, magneto sheet, sorry, plasma sheet. My apologies. So it's a huge plasma sheet. Now that plasma sheet being made of electrically charged particles is very sensitive to the magnetic field. As Jupiter rotates much more rapidly, two and a half times as rapidly as Earth does, as the magnetic field rotates, it tries to make this plasma sheet spin along with the magnetic field. And that's fine, but somewhere between the orbit of Ganymede and the orbit of Callisto, it's just too much. The magnetic field is getting weaker as you go further away. The speed at which you have to get this plasma sheet to rotate is getting higher and higher as you get further and further away. And there's not enough there. And what happens is the magnetic field lines, and here you can see one here, get really distorted. And they create massive electrical currents that fire electrically charged material from the plasma sheet down onto the upper atmosphere of Jupiter to create its own special aurora. So when we were looking at this picture here, this main auroral oval pretty much traces the point at which the plasma sheet can no longer keep up, can no longer co-rotate with the planet and you get these enormous shears and, <coughs> and electrical currents being generated. So that's what we're looking at here. You can see things in some ways a bit clearer. So this is taken from a few thousand kilometers above uh, Jupiter's southern pole, and it's very, very, very detailed. In some ways, it's easier to understand if you lose a little bit of the detail, and this is the Hubble Space Telescope ultraviolet, ultraviolet image. Here's this main auroral oval again. Here are regions of aurora going off inside the main auroral oval near to the poles. This spot here, this is the magnetic footprint of Io onto the, onto the planet's atmosphere. Here's the magnetic footprint of uh, Europa. 
And then closer in, you've got the magnetic footprint of, uh, <clears throat> of Ganymede. So as the magnetic field is sweeping past these moons, it's also generating huge electric currents. And these electric currents cause these bright lights, these auroral features from the moons themselves, as well as from the main magnetosphere uh, to show up in Jupiter. Now we have something called the energy gap at the um, giant planets, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the tops of the planetary atmospheres are hundreds of degrees hotter than they should be if you take into account the amount of energy they're absorbing from the sun. But these features we see here and the wind systems and the electric currents and everything that go along with them create heating that's a hundred times greater than the solar inputs and it may well be that some of this energy can be transferred away from the polar regions into the down towards the equator and account for this so-called energy gap. Okay, so that's a little bit on Jupiter. <clears throat> I could go on for hours, but we haven't time. I wanted to show you a couple of things from Saturn. So Saturn is a little bit intermediate between Jupiter. It's got a very big magnetosphere of its own, but it also is, because its magnetic moment is not so great, its magnetic field is not so great, it's also much more susceptible to the solar wind than Jupiter is. So its aurora are somewhere between what we see on Earth and what we see on Jupiter. And this is a fantastic movie put together by my friend uh, Tom Stallard up at Leicester University showing the aurora on uh, Saturn. Now in the infrared, that's both from Jupiter and from Saturn, we're looking at a special form of hydrogen called H3+. Um, it's a little triangle of hydrogen atoms joined together, but they've lost an electron. So they should have three electrons, but they've lost one. They've only got two electrons holding them together, and that makes it them positively charged. And so it's the H3 plus molecule. And if you want to know more about the H3 plus molecule, I wrote a whole book about it called The Chemical Cosmos, a guided tour, nothing like getting a plug in here, never mind. Um, so you can always have a look at that if you want to. But that, that shows the kind of aurora that you get from uh, Saturn. They're very powerful again. They're also generating much more energy than the upper atmosphere is getting from sunlight. One of the organizers asked me to say something about the hexagon. Actually, the hexagon's got nothing to do with the aurora, but never mind, it's another pretty picture. So here you're seeing again the kind of the cloud tops of Saturn. And you can see this six sided figure. So in the red are the cloud tops, and the hexagon is in the red. And I've overlain the aurora over the top of the hexagon. And the two fit very nicely but they actually don't have anything much to do with each other. So that's just a coincidence, but it's, it makes for a very pretty picture. And I don't know much about the hexagon. So I asked my friend Lee Fletcher and he said, well, what it is, is a jet stream that if you map it in latitude and longitude, it looks like a sine wave. But then when you project it onto the sphere, or it's not quite a sphere, it's a flattened sphere of Saturn, it comes up looking like this six-sided uh, hexagon. And if I have just a moment, which I might do, uh, I'm going to try and um, share another screen. Does this work? Your screen sharing is paused. How do I share another? Oh, new share, here we go, new share. So I'm going to try to share this screen with you. Is this sharing with you? I don't think so, Steve. Oh, no, I've got, it's all right, the button is hidden. There we go. Yeah. And this is a movie in the left-hand corner. It's a movie of the space station going over the auroral zones, uh, the northern auroral zones of Earth. And the greens and reds are mainly oxygen. And if you see a little blue in it, that's nitrogen emission. 
So here we go. And this is stunning in my view. Can you make it full screen? Uh, I can try. Let's see if it'll go full screen. Can you see yeah. that full screen? Excellent. There we go. And you see how active and changing and the beautiful colors and so on and so forth. And that's the uh, solar panel. And we're now going into the daylight and you can just about make out the aurora. So I'll stop it there. I'll stop that particular share. Um, do you still have this one sharing? So yeah, we're back to normal. You're back to normal. And I can share this screen in case anybody's interested in having a look at that, that screen. OK, we're back to normal. So yeah, right. Um, so yeah, just uh, as you are on that screen, yes. perhaps uh, we have first question is very related is why do the northern lights fluctuate? Why do you know they, they change over time? And Right. So the solar wind, although I've only given you a very, very brief description of it, the solar wind fluctuates all the time, all the time. The sun is incredibly active. So the amount of material coming off at any one time varies constantly. Um, sometimes you get very powerful what are called coronal mass ejections, and then you get incredibly bright aurorae, and you can even see them as far south as the um, Excuse me, of the um, latitude of London and sometimes even a bit uh, uh, further south than that. So solar wind fluctuates, its interaction with the Earth's magnetic field fluctuates and the Earth's magnetic field is itself, or sorry, the Earth's magnetosphere is itself extremely dynamic. So where I showed you that magnetic field lines are dragged away from the sun by the influence of the solar wind to form this what's called magnetotail downstream from the solar wind. Sometimes you stretch those magnetic field lines too far and they snap and ping back again. And when they ping back again in towards the earth, then you get more aurorae being formed and different types of aurorae being formed. So it's an incredibly dynamic um, uh, environments that we live in. You know, we're, we're here on the earth, we don't take much notice of, of the magnetosphere, we don't take much notice of the solar wind, generally speaking, but they are very, very dynamic features, and that's what causes uh, so much fluctuation in the aurora. And then you've got the fact that you've got turbulence in the, in the Earth's own atmosphere as well to complicate things. <clears throat> Thank Does you. that help? Yeah, so next question. Um... Since you, you talked about the, the magnetic field of, of Jupiter, so what are the mechanisms producing such a ma magnetic field in a, a gas giant like uh, Jupiter? So these are dynamos, just like the Earth has a dynamo. Um, I'm not an expert on how the magnetic field is being produced in Jupiter, but it's thought that the dynamo is not right towards the center of the planet, that it's not, that it's much closer to the surface. Now, closer to the surface is a relative thing because uh, at the center of Jupiter, you've got a solidish core that is, I don't know, 10, 30 times the size of the Earth. And then you've got these layers around it where you've probably got a layer, a big layer, of metallic hydrogen. And it's very likely that electrical currents in this layer of metallic hydrogen, because the pressure is so great that it turns hydrogen into a metal like uh, iron or, <clears throat> or any other metal, or maybe, maybe mercury is a better uh, example of a, of, a, of a metal. And it's currents there, a dynamo effect there that is um, creating the magnetic field. Now, it used to be thought that you could only get a dynamo if the, or the magnetic field, the poles of the mag magnetic field did not line up perfectly with the rotational poles of the planet. And that's the, certainly the case on Earth and it's certainly the case on Jupiter. But in Saturn, the magnetic field poles 
and the rotational poles of Saturn line up pretty much exactly. But Saturn's got a pretty strong magnetic field. So there's a lot of rethinking going on as to exactly what's happening. But basically, dynamos are creating the, the uh, magnetic field in all of the planets that have a strong magnetic field. Right, uh, excellent. Maybe I'll stop sharing your screen. So yeah, so we can go back to the yeah panel view. Um, so we've talked about auroras on different planets. Maybe uh, Corentin, you want to show the, the 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 third question? I think it was. Yep, yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, right. So... Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, the, the third question, well, uh, actually the second question in, in, in the order in which they were published in Twitter was uh, on how many bodies in the solar system uh, have auroras been observed. So part of the answers have been given by Steve. Um, so the answer is not only, well, we have observed it obviously on, on the Earth. Um, we've seen very beautiful movies and pictures on Jupiter as well as Saturn. Um, a bit less... Uh, Certain, but maybe uh, Steve, you can comment on that uh, slightly later uh, on Uranus and Neptune, which have possible yeah. observations of um, uh, auroras, auroras. But also, very interestingly, on uh, on some Jupiter moons, such as Ganymede, uh, we have uh, observation of auroras, and on Io as well, and also less certainly on other Jovian moons like Europa and Callisto. Uh, which, if all of them were correct, there would be at least eight bodies in the solar system having auroras. Can you confirm that, uh, Steve? I think that's that's about right. Um, you know, the, uh, the there might be something on Mercury. Um, Mars has got a very funny um, magnetic field with little pockets of, of magnetism scattered across the planet and. You could also, and because it's got a thin atmosphere, you could also get aurorae there. I don't think anybody would claim for certain they've got it. That's in the solar system. One of the big questions we would like the answer to is, are there any aurorae on all of these extrasolar planets that have been found? And we just don't know the answer. I mean, many, many, many thousands of extrasolar planets have been discovered. A good proportion of those must have magnetic fields. All stars have some kind of stellar wind. So there's got to be interactions going on similar to those between the Earth and the solar wind and you know, Jupiter and Saturn and the, other, and the other planets and the solar wind. Um, and maybe, and this is um, a nod to Ayush here, it might be that the first evidence we get of aurorae from extrasolar planets are by detecting the radio waves that they might generate. Uh, great. Very exciting. Yeah, <laughs> e extrasolar radio waves. Yeah, that's, that's some proper hardcore science there. <laughs> Amazing, thanks. Uh, so, so let me then go to the last question. Um, so here the, we had uh, five pairs of images um, and each of them was either taken from Earth or from outside of the Earth. Um, so I'll just go picture by picture. So the first one, uh, a lot of people correctly found that the left picture is actually taken from Earth. It's, it's an image from a hurricane. So the right one is, is actually a galaxy. Um, the second one was uh, a bit more difficult because the correct picture is actually on the left side and it looks like footsteps, but it's not. And on the right side is just in, in Baranali, so on the Earth. Uh, so the, the third, um, for the third uh, pair of images, the right one is actually an oil droplet and the left one is Venus as seen by uh, in um, ultraviolet lights. Um, the next one was also extremely tricky because they look very similar, except one of them is uh, coffee, like the steam getting out of coffee, and the right one is actually a nebula. So that, that was tricky. And the last one, um, they look similar because they're in uh, black and white, except one of them is on a comet, the last one, and the right one is, uh, I think it's in the Himalayans, uh, but uh, well, obviously it's quite, it's quite hard to guess from there. So we had quite a lot of uh, good uh, good answers. Thank you for uh, participating to the, the questions, and I'll uh, 
leave uh, Romain uh, to the conclusions. Yeah, right. Uh, so the game is, uh, you know, free pint to whoever can uh, get the name of the comet the fastest. <laughs> um, so we have a so we have a, a bunch of questions. I think we'll end on these. Uh, yeah, let's do rapid fires questions. So yeah, comment on um, the the impact of uh, the solar wind on uh, electronics on satellites and the ISS, of course. Uh, maybe for Steve. Right. So I mean, this is this is a real issue, um, and for um, astronauts going outside and doing sort of. Um, activities on the, as they used to on the shuttle and uh, uh, on the uh, on the space station outside they have to really look out and it, it's important to know if we think there's going to be anything like a coronal uh, mass ejection coming because that could impact them um, it could also make it or it will make it um, necessary to have very strong radiation shielding if we ever send people over to Mars because we'll be outside of the Earth's magnetosphere. We won't get that protection. So we'll be um, directly exposed to the, the solar wind there. Um, and electronics, I mean, you know, um, electrically charged particles, you know what happens if you get a, a short, um, you blow all your fuses in, in the household. Well, you can get a similar kind of short um, as a result of, uh, not identical, but a similar kind of short as a result of the solar wind impacting on satellites, impacting on power grids. So it can do quite a lot of, quite a lot of damage. And that's why we're spending much more time investigating what we call space weather, which is the weather in the, um, the solar system around us and particularly inside the magnetosphere. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next question, um, how do astronomers measure the magnetosphere of a planet? How do they, <laughs> how do they measure it? With a magnetometer. Basically, it's a it's an instrument. Um, my friends at Imperial College have made their careers out of making magnetometers that have gone on pretty much every space mission, I think, since the days of the voyages. And they are doing precisely that. They are measuring the magnetic field. And they are able to make, measure the overall strength of the magnetic field. Uh, and then they can uh, measure the strength of the magnetic field in various directions. And then you have to do some pretty fancy modeling to say, well, OK, <clears throat> If the magnetic field at this distance from Jupiter is like this, and it's this distance and that position from Jupiter, it's like that, and so on and so forth. We put all of that together into a complicated model to try to derive a mathematical form for the magnetic field. Um, the people at NASA Goddard are the world's leading experts in doing this and they have a whole series of models of the magnetic fields of Jupiter and Saturn and, 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 and so on. Uh, but they're all based on individual point measurements and you try to work out, well, if it's like this, how could it be like that and have something that uh, connects them, all these points together mathematically. So you get this, this idea of a mathematical model of the field. Right, great. Um, I think we're nearing to an end. Oh yeah, uh, maybe very quickly. Um, the different colors in the auroras are due to different atoms. Correct. Um, and if you can just comment on the physics behind that. Ah, oh, okay. So what happens is that, uh, say, a charged particle, an electron, because that's what um, a lot of the um, uh, aurora are being excited by. An electron hits an atom. It causes the electrons within the atom to change their energy state and to become excited. And then very rapidly, 
those electrons within the atom, because an atom is made up of a positively charged nucleus and a cloud of electrons around it. So those electrons that have been excited, they will give up their energy and they'll blast it out in a photon of light. And because we have something called quantum mechanics, all electron energy levels within an atom are quantized. So that means the energy jumps are certain values and certain values only of energy, and that corresponds to a certain wavelength of light. So as I said, the reds and the greens are due to changes in the electron structure of oxygen. And if there's a bit of blue, that's usually down to changes in the electron structure of nitrogen. But these atoms are being thumped and atoms and molecules are being thumped by the electrons coming in from the solar wind, causing these changes in the configuration and then relaxing back to a more comfortable position, like slouching back on the sofa. All right. I think, uh, Chiara, we have a final question, maybe. Um... I think you had a, there was a question for you, but it's more for everyone, really, which is um, what about, so you talked about radio, basically imaging of galaxies, but the question is, uh, of course, um, because these radio telescopes appear in various films, uh, what about radio signals from, from aliens, right? Always, yeah, I'm surprised it's taken so long for us to get here, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, radio, radio signals are probably our best bet. Um, to identify signals from other um, civilizations, or as um, Steve mentioned, we can also detect them from auroras on planets around different stars. So they seem to be able to travel uh, long distances and you can encode a lot of information in it. So if you were a, an alien trying to reach out, I think radio would be your best choice. Um, so there is, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about it, the SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which is basically a continuous monitoring of the radio sky um, using some dedicated receivers and telescopes. Um, unfortunately, we haven't heard anything yet. Um, there's no, for sure, a signal that could not be explained um, by other physics or that can be easily attributed to um, aliens or advanced civilizations. So yeah, unfortunately, there's nothing happened on that front yet. I don't know if Steve has some other anecdotes about um, what we've, we've seen. So I am old enough to have watched the BBC production of Fred Hoyle's A for Andromeda. Now, Fred Hoyle was a very brilliant but slightly controversial and left field um, astronomer based in, in Cambridge. And he wrote some, you know, some really interesting stuff. In A for Andromeda, a, an alien civilization beams radio waves at Earth and those radio waves are interpreted and they are the blueprint to create a very beautiful actress. Now, you're much too young, all of you, to remember Julie Christie, but the original Andromeda who was created as a result of these radio waves was, uh, as, as I say, this very beautiful actress and it's a great story uh, and you can definitely still get hold of the book. Um, but I don't think the BBC ever recorded the A for Andromeda series, which is a, a great shame. But these were radio waves being interpreted always by very smart scientists like Fred Hoyle himself. Yeah, they do make for great science fiction material, that's for sure. Right, um, I think that's all. Uh, if no one has an additional comment. Uh, oh, I, can I give you one more uh, anecdote? Yes, please. Yeah, so pulsars are these uh, very strong um, radio sources. Um, and they pulse, as the name suggests, at uh, very, very fast frequencies. And they were first detected by a PhD student 
called Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Some of you might have heard of her. She's an amazing woman who's just given a million pound uh, or million dollar prize to um, fund um, education for uh, young women physicists. But she saw these pulses detected by the uh, radio telescope in uh, Cambridge that Ayush um, mentioned, previous version of that. And she had no idea what they were. And alongside these pulses, and in those days you recorded your data on a continuous stream of paper, paper trace. And alongside the, um, the traces where she was seeing these pulses, she put LGM, little green men. And that was the detection of pulses for which her supervisors got the Nobel prize, but she didn't, and that's a disgrace. And yeah, it took um, a long time for her work to actually be recognized. And now I think slowly the story is coming out and justice is catching up. Yes. Yeah. Well, on that very positive um, and outward looking, I think we'll end up here. Um, yeah, please subscribe, uh, share, the, share the link. Uh, the video will stay, of course, on our YouTube channel. You can um, join, uh, well, uh, join us on Twitter or Instagram, where you will see, of course, questions and pictures leading up to the next talks uh, in two weeks' time. And uh, if you're an astronomer in London, please, you know, uh, send us an email if you want to give a talk. Uh, we're very happy, for example, to have the, you know, the experiences from Imperial joining. That would be wonderful. And uh, on this, I think uh, we'll say bye-bye. Take care. Take care. Bye. Take care.